Good afternoon, and welcome to the New Capital Webinar Market Review. I'm Catherine Barr, the Director of Communications at New Capital. If you have any questions during today's session, uh, you can use the Q&A tool or the chat tool in your webinar menu at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we will answer any questions about the content of the webinar in a Q&A session um, at the completion. And I'm going to get us started by reading the following regulatory disclosures. This New Capital presentation is being made available for educational purposes only and should not be used for any other purpose. The information presented does not does not constitute and should not be construed as an offering of advisory services or an offer to sell or solicitation to buy any securities, related financial instruments, financial services, or other services in any jurisdiction. Past investment performance is not an indication of future results. Wherever there is the potential for loss, wherever there is the potential for profit, there is also the possibility of loss. Certain information contained herein concerning economic trends and performance is based on or derived from information provided by independent third-party sources. New Capital believes that the sources from which such information have been obtained are reliable. However, we cannot guarantee the accuracy of such information and have not independently audited these sources. Okay, thank you. And I will turn it over to Leonard Golub. Okay, Catherine, thank you. Um... First of all, let, let me uh, let me just go back to there. Um, just a little preface to today's uh, webinar, and I'm going to give everyone a warning that uh, we could run long. I could run long. There's just a lot to talk about, and um, I'm going to give a mea culpa also that um, we've just been really busy. I've been really busy, but we everybody's really busy these days. Um, Yesterday, I had a full day of uh, like athletic ceremonies for both my daughter and my son. And um, I didn't get to fully assembling the presentation. I woke up at uh, and started working on it around 6 a.m. today. Uh, but just a few minutes ago, I got caught short. And the, and the reason is, is there's just so much to talk about. There's so many slides. I'm going to show you some slides during this presentation that I uh saw a, a week or two ago two weeks ago uh, i was in austin for a, a conference at dimensional and i thought they were fabulous slides and 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 uh, so our terrific partners there provided me with copies of them and i wanted to show them to you um and then i'll also show my usual assortment of jp morgan slides but i think i got like 30 slides here and so if you gotta go then then just go um, but but I'm warning everybody that that uh, could go longer. I don't have anything on my calendar for this afternoon. We always keep these webinar days completely clear, both for uh, last minute preparation, and I've certainly needed that uh, this morning. And then if there's any follow up, uh, or we go long, or whatever, or somebody wants to call me afterwards and say whatever they want to say to me. Uh, so, so that's the that's the first uh, thing I want to say. And I'm going to start today before I jump into the market. I've got uh, I don't even want to call them housekeeping items. They're just sort of not market related things, but they're but they're related to new capital or they're related to some services that that we're providing. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start with that today. And and I'm going to get to uh, an email that we received from a client uh, this morning, just to just to show you that there are concerns. Uh, before I do, just a few bullet points. Our annual conference. Are we good on this date, Catherine? October 26. It is scheduled for now. Yes. Okay. So please put it on your calendar. Save the date as October 26. That's a Thursday. Uh, we started to learn a few conferences ago that Thursday is the best day rather than Friday, people go out of town and so on. And I think we've been going, what, about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. has yes. been our general time. We've been adjusting it around the margins. Sometimes it's set for 2.30 or a 9.30 start. And and that could change. But if you had to put something for right now, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and it's going to be in the same place that we've been having it, which is uh, over at the building uh, next to the Edwards Cinema and the Mercedes-Benz uh, dealership, the building there that's also owned by Granite Properties, our landlord, and they have that really nice uh, conference room. Um, I'm happy to announce we have a, a young intern who's coming back to be with us for a couple of weeks this summer, Asher Mall, who's a terrific young man who contacted us and said, I'd like to come back. 
And uh, so um, if you have any young people in your lives, we can't do it this summer, but in, if there are any future years where there's a young person in your life who's interested in uh, doing just a couple of weeks of a summer internship at a registered investment advisor, uh, then you might want to just uh, g give them our name and uh, put them in touch with us. And um, I also want to say that we really have our next generation program very much in full swing. We send out a lot of books and some gift cards and so forth on high school graduations and college graduations. And we have initial meetings to talk with young people uh, about um you know, basic financial things and, and to try to just make sure that they move to the next phase of their lives with their heads screwed on straight. And so um, if you're not sure if we have your young people uh, in our database or we don't have their birthdays, a lot of it keys off of birth dates in our system and it comes up and gives us a reminder or we don't know for sure that we have their graduation dates, then uh, then please do get in touch with us. I would get in touch with uh, Casey and uh, just make sure that we've got everybody lined out in the database because we have found it's really a very helpful thing both to a young person and to their families if we have an early conversation with them and they feel like there's uh, other people that they can talk to or ask questions about or help with. And many young people that we work with actually have accounts uh, with us, and we can help them with that also. Um, JC and I have, and then the third bullet point, JC and I have been working on a new document that every client is going to have, and uh, uh, it is called an investment policy statement. It's a very detailed document about how we're approaching your investments in particular uh, through asset allocation. We're already doing these things, but this is just a document that that uh, that goes with it and goes behind it. And uh, we recently signed on a systems provider that generates these investment policy statements and enables us to keep them organized. We're now over 100 client households, I don't know, maybe 110, I don't know, and we're pushing towards $400 million under management. And so we have to have systems uh, that keep these things. And we haven't really been able to find a good system that does investment policy statements until uh, recently, it's a, a product called Hidden Levers, and it's going to produce uh, what's about a 40 or 50 page uh, report for you um, that that uh, is the definition of of how we uh, how of how we define your risk tolerance and risk capacity, and how we define the right model portfolio for you, and uh, and allocations and things like that. So that's going to be out this year. All right. This is an email I got from a client today. If the U.S. goes into a long, longer default or a long default, the Council of Economic Advisors says 8.3 million people will lose their jobs and the stock market will fall by 45 percent. Um, and there's there's so much that that I could talk about. Right. I mean, there's there's markets and there's. Um, the hike of interest rates by the Fed, uh, they increased it yesterday by another quarter of a point. And um, what about the U.S. dollar and international developed markets? I'll touch on a bunch of this today, you know, but 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 front and center for a lot of people is this debt crisis. Uh, and and um, and the question that the client asks is, what are you doing to minimize the potential financial disaster lurking under the rocks or or? The suggestion, what am I doing to minimize the potential financial disaster? And my answer is, you're looking at it. So go ahead. If you're if you're looking at the slide, look at me instead. Look at the look at look at the uh, I'm assuming everybody can see the video of me. And uh, and so the answer you see on the video of me is what I'm doing. Everything I'm doing, I don't say everything, but a lot of what I'm doing, you're looking at right here in the video. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll look behind me. What you see behind me in the photo is exactly what I'm doing. I'm raising a family. I'm raising two children to tell the truth and to be educated and to enter the workforce uh, and to be good upstanding citizens and to vote. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> 
<laughs> to minimize potential financial disaster. Because if we're talking about treasury bonds, treasury bonds of any country, the strength of them, the willingness of people all over the world to purchase treasury bonds of any treasury, be it the U.S. Treasury or the uh, Croatian Treasury or the Argentine Treasury, depends upon the strength of the people who stand behind those treasuries. That's it. Now, it also has to do with some other things as well, and you see that in the picture as well. What is the fertility of the land uh, that that uh, is backed by the treasury and and uh, factories and ingenuity and things like that? All of those things are what back treasuries, government treasury bonds. So it's a very good question by the client, what am I doing? But if you think there's something I as a financial advisor can do, then I think you're 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 off base. We can make portfolios as best as we can, but I can't prevent Congress from taking steps or not taking steps that would lead to a default in the United States Treasury bond. What I can do is what I'm doing. There it is. You see it right there. I'm a husband and a father and, a, and a, you know, I take care of the land. And and then here uh, I've got some degrees hanging on the wall. So I educated myself and I'm doing this, the same for my children. And you see me sitting at my desk. I come to work. And, and all of these things are really honestly what back the U.S. Treasury because the Treasury's got to have either the, the money comes from either two sources in our government, either tax revenues, and tax revenues require honest people willing to pay their taxes. And you may think all countries enjoy that resource, but they don't. <laughs> and I pay my taxes, and I tabulate them, and and, uh, and and whatever the bill comes out to be, that's what I send the check for. And that goes to back treasuries. and And but but people buying treasuries have to have confidence that the people who are issuing the bonds are going to pay off those bonds. And so I teach my children to keep your promise if you make a promise. And in my business, I practice the keeping of promises to you. But, you know, I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. Even everybody on this call, if it was just us, we can't do it. To that point, last night I went to my son's athletic, uh, his school's athletic banquet recognition, and they called for all the teams to come up, the football team and 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 uh, the men and the women and the and the uh, lacrosse team and and the. Uh, volleyball and basketball and they called for the swimming team and when they called for the swimming team one student went up out of 15 or 20 swimmers one was the only one in attendance my son that was it now he won the mvp award i was very proud of him but it was a big disappointment to see that that only one swimmer on the swim team showed up at the award ceremony well, if we have the equivalent of that in the United States of America, only one person shows up and and pay is willing to pay debt promises, then it's it's a problem. So what I'm doing is what we're all doing. We're living our lives with integrity and honesty. That's what we're doing to minimize the potential financial disaster. What Congress does, we don't have any control over that right now today because there's no election right now right <laughs> our say and our direct control over those things comes during elections and so i've done that too i've shown up and i've voted doesn't matter how i voted but i voted okay so um so let me start with that by saying that if anybody on this call is looking for me to save the United States or save, you know, your portfolios from all potential effects of what Congress may or may not do, that's not within my power. 
I can make a what I think is a really good portfolio, and I can I can make a portfolio that is going to be uh, uh, you know more defensive. And we've done that. We did that last year. Our portfolios outperformed benchmarks by quite a bit. Very proud of our portfolio performances over the last three years have been really terrific versus benchmarks. But what we're talking about are U.S. Treasuries. We're not even talking about stocks here. They're not talking about, in Congress, defaulting or putting out of business the 80% of the economy that is uh, in private hands, right? 80% of the national economy is uh, operated by private enterprise, 20% by governments. So we're not even talking about the stock market when we're talking, I mean, we're not talking directly. There can be knock-on effects, of course, theoretically, if the U.S. defaults on its debt. But we're talking actually about what is supposed to be the safest instrument, U.S. Treasury bonds. That's the irony of the whole thing, that there are people in Congress who want to take what is regarded in the world of finance even. Now I'm talking about the world of politics or geopolitics. I'm talking about the world of finance, traditionally, what finance academics and financial professionals have considered to be the stalking horse for the safest bond in the world it is the u.s treasury and so there are people who who appear to want to take that status and inject a bunch of risk and worry and concern over that so we're not talking about stocks we're talking about treasuries it's a big paradox okay and again if you have questions Raise your hand and we'll see when we can get to them. Catherine monitors questions. And I guess if something breaks through that, you know, I need to take immediately, uh, we will. Next topic I want to take is uh, banks, right? I haven't mentioned banks yet. I wrote a long piece on Silicon Valley Bank, and you should feel free to go back and revisit that. And another uh, the piece uh, also we've put out recently about what, what we now offer at New Capital Management as regards cash. But I want to show you a statement that a client who I had a meeting with yesterday handed me. This is for one of their business accounts. The bank is Third Coast Bank. This is an actual statement from Third Coast Bank. The statement is dated April 28th of 2023. There is $601,000 in the account, so it's not a nothing account. And you can see that the interest that the bank paid our client on their business account was a goose egg, zero. And so I've entitled this slide fiduciary obligation versus bank obligation. You know, I talk on a somewhat regular basis about what is a fiduciary obligation and why are people seeking out fiduciary advisors now rather than brokers and now rather than banks. Well, in the simplest way to describe it, here it is. <laughs> Did anyone from the bank call this client with $600,000 in the bank and say, hey, you're holding a lot in this account. We should be able to get you some interest earned on your commercial bank deposits. It gets worse. This client uh, either is or was or still is a shareholder in the bank. So they're not even calling their shareholders and saying, we can get you higher interest. And why, why does the bank love this situation? Why does the bank look at this customer and say, oh, we love this customer? Because the bank takes the $600,000 and puts it into treasury bonds yielding 4%. So what is $600,000 earning 4% a year? $24,000. You may think it's only Third Coast Bank. This is a Chase Premier account. Premier. A $203,000 balance paying 0.01%. So we as fiduciaries at New Capital Management have to put your interests first. 
The bank is not a fiduciary. They don't have to put your interest first. Brokers are not fiduciaries. They don't have to put your interest first. But I, I can really get in big trouble if I put you in, you know, something that doesn't earn you any interest. I have to put your interest first. That's how you're paying me as a fiduciary advisor. So what do we have in cash? This is the document that I sent out uh, and JC and I worked on very hard recently. We have a whole lineup of cash options. A bank sweep option. With a bank sweep option, we can take your money up to $5 million. You may know that there's a $250,000 limit per account by the FD, uh, put, you know, that is sponsored by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that will insure accounts up to, but not beyond, $250,000. But what if you have $2 million? And you've probably heard people going from bank to bank and opening different accounts so that they, and then they put $250,000 at all the banks. You don't have to do that. You can just give it to new capital if this is how you want to earn your interest. Now, it's a lower rate of interest because that's what demand deposits earn is a lower rate of interest. But we, working with Fidelity, have a bank suite facility where we will deal out your money to different banks, big banks, not insignificant banks, medium-sized banks too. We've got a whole roster of banks, but we're talking – highly stable uh, banks, and we will handle that process so we can do that virtually rather than you physically having to walk from bank to bank and open accounts with all of them. We have a virtual ability to, to uh, spread your money between banks, and we can do it up to $5 million for a joint account and $2.5 million for an individual account. If you want to hold bank to pure bank deposits, we can do that for you. Okay. We can get you bank CDs. You don't have to be wedded to the bank that you've walked into or that you have an account at. They will give you their CD, probably. But we can get you from an entire warehouse full of CDs that are both primary, meaning those that are being sold right now by the bank, or those that are simply trading in a marketplace that have been issued. So, for example, there may have been a two-year CD that expires in six months, that means it's now a six-month CD, and we may purchase that. That's a six-month CD. It began life as a two-year CD, but it's now technically, really, actually, a six-month CD, and we can get you CDs all over the place. We can tell our system, give us the highest-yielding CD across the United States, and it'll come back and give it to us, and we can buy that for you. And what does that get you? Well, it's around 5% right now for a six-month CD. Money market funds, uh, which are cash equivalents. Uh, now, the duration of the six-month CD is six months, right? So you have a little bit of interest rate risk there. Money markets have very low duration, one to two weeks, and money markets are 4.5%. What is a money market? A money market is a mutual fund of ultra-short-term bonds. Uh, and so the bonds are coming due very, very soon. Oftentimes, these involve what are known as re repurchase agreements where money is lent overnight. And the uh, uh, seller of the bond agrees to buy it back the next day. And so there are all sorts of different types of repurchase or repo agreements. Some are uh, Federal Reserve, some are Federal Home, home Loan Board uh, or Home Loan Bank uh, repos. Some are corporate repos, but that's a repo. And so this is a money market. It's a mutual fund, 4.5%. Treasury bonds for a six-month bond. And you can see that a treasury bond, and I understand there is concern that treasuries may default. I get it. So you may say, I don't want that. Fine. Okay. Uh, but treasury bonds, you see, yield pretty much what bank CDs do. There's a reason for that. Bank CDs tend to very much mirror what yields on treasury bonds are. But there are people who would rather, in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank and uh, First Republic uh, going belly up, First Republic got bought, I understand that. I think Silicon Valley got 
bought also, but it, but but it, but both were bankrupt uh, and sold off by uh, the government. Um, so uh, there are people who would rather have treasuries than anything else. Berkshire Hathaway, for example, has a Warren Buffett has a huge and abiding interest in treasuries. And I assure you, he still has it, even despite what's going on in Congress right now. So we can get you treasury bonds. We have a whole dashboard radar screen full of treasury bonds, whatever you want. So we can buy those bonds. And then finally, we have our ECM, our enhanced cash model, which is a model of um, mutual funds that JC and I have assembled of a mix of, as you can see at the bottom, ultra short term treasuries, agency bonds, municipal bonds, uh, corporate bonds, um, and, and even some reverse purchase agreements. And the benefit here is that we have a low duration, four month duration, and it's very diversified between treasuries and corporates and municipals and so on. And so if, if, if that's what floats your boat, I want super diversified, uh, then, then uh, that's almost 5% as well. Now, um, I'm not going to go through all these other things. The, the fees are different and the risks are different and some have FDIC insurance. I just don't have time today. But if this is of interest to you, let us know. And this is not unusual what's going on, that we are being asked to provide cash solutions to our clients. I just showed you the statements where the client is earning 0%. That'll have you call your financial advisor and say, what can you do? But also, there's just a general realization that putting money in a single bank with, with a um, team of banking executives, and, 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 and if it's a regional bank, that means it's going to be more directly exposed to whoever they've been lending to in that regional economy, whatever the commercial uh, real estate is or whatever the local businesses are, oil and gas here or technology out in Silicon Valley, you get the point, finance in New York. Um, uh, that you may that, that the bank has a lot of exposure to those local sectors, and uh, you may be susceptible if the bank is not well run. And I don't want to even say well run. I take that back. If the bank just if its risk controls go awry, as it did in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, uh, that people are turning to wealth advisors and saying, "We really like this diversification thing that you practice. Is, is it, does it apply to cash?" They ask, and my answer is yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay, so that's a discussion of cash. Um, but that leads into a discussion. Well, the bank gets paid on the spread by by what it uh, pays on its deposit and what it lends out, right? That's how the bank makes money. Now, of course, if the bank is paying on a deposit, 0%, as I showed you, is the case, for both the Chase account and the uh, what it was it South South Coast, what was it name of that bank Third Coast. If it's zero, bank loves it. They're paying nothing for their deposit, and they're, you know, they can loan it out for real estate loans. They can loan it out for commercial loans, or they can just buy treasuries too. <laughs> then they have a very big spread. They've got you know that's a five percent spread right now. New capital. We earn our money because we charge you a fee directly. You pay me directly. But that's why I have an incentive to get you a good rate of return on whatever it is that I'm investing you in, including cash. And what I wanted to show you is this is something new. Uh, this compares a large group of similar firms, registered investment advisors and new capital. The registered investment advisors, the large group of that that's in the thousands, comes to us from our uh, portfolio software provider, Orion, and they're one of the largest in the industry, and they do our billing also. And so they do the billing for thousands and thousands of, of other advisors, so they know what advisors' fees are and bill, and they put out uh, for all of us to see what the averages are. And that's in blue for the whole group of advisors. And we have made you a chart so you can see that our fees that we charge are lower and in all of these categories, whether your account is $300,000 account or your account is a $100 million account, we are lower than our peers. And we, we think, not only do we think, we know we provide greater levels of service. We win business all the time from other advisors. We recently gained a client 
who's based in Los Angeles, who was with one of the top registered investment advisors based in Los Angeles and really all over the country. Big one, billions and billions of dollars. And what is she telling her friends? They're unbelievable. So I don't I don't want to pat myself on the back, but it's not just that our fees are lower and so you're getting worse. No. All right. Now, that's all the good news. Now I'm going to give you the bad news on fees. <laughs> There's a reason why I started with all that good news on fees and good news on cash. Uh, because we have a new fee that we're going to put in place. Just stay, stay in your chair. It's not going to break you. Um, we are starting on July 1st a new fee on all custodied accounts. It's $10 per quarter. So $40 a year. And that's for any account that is in, in, in our custody, which means mostly at Fidelity. If we have to bring in data from an aggregated account, from like a 401k, you want us to bring into our reports, it's $20 a quarter. Why are we doing this fee? We're doing it because that's what we pay our data provider, Orion. I just showed you the the chart on fees that comes from Orion. And Orion, every time we open a new account for you, we pay uh, administrative fees in the exactly these amounts. This is not a profit center, this new fee. It's only helping us defray. And I came to the decision, and, it, and because we have so many accounts now, it adds up to a lot of money. And I didn't want a situation where some client with 50 accounts, and we have those, uh, where where the fees that we pay for that client is going to be way more than a client with one account or two accounts. And so I made the decision that this is going to be a pass-through fee. If you have any problem with it, please let me know. You know, if it's if it's uh, if it's really disturbing and upsetting, please let me know. But I tell you, we do, this is exactly what we are charged: not a penny less, not a penny more. And so uh, this allows us, because of all the account-based reporting that we do for you, and uh, trade rebalancing and so on, uh, this is what we do. Why didn't I do it when we were with Morningstar? The reason is Morningstar didn't charge per account. They just gave us a flat fee, but Orion charges per account. And so we're going to pass that on. Again, let me know if this is a problem. We'll have more announcements. We're going to have full disclosures on it. And I wanted to save this uh, for last after I gave you all the uh, stuff on cash and on our fees in relation to the uh, industry. Okay. Let me get now to portfolio and market-based stuff. I know that's why you're here today. And by the way, thank you so much for being here. It's great to have all of you. Um, you know, you've seen articles in the last few years. Is the 60-40 portfolio dead or is variations on that is is diversification dead right that was going on uh, these types of articles over the last few years and um i recently attended as i told you a conference in uh, in austin with dimensional and a guy named nigel walker's fabulous uh had some slides that he had developed around this and and i asked nigel if i could please show you some of them today and i'm going to show you some of them and let me tell you, you all are seeing slides that, you know, like are not seen by the general public. This has not yet been made client ready, uh, bi-dimensional. Uh, so it's sort of a special thing, these slides that I'm showing you today. So let's let's start with um, this. 2022 was bad. Capital B, capital A, capital D. Why? Why was it so bad? And when I say bad, I didn't think it was bad. I didn't have a problem with it. I've told people repeatedly, I really like that interest rates are are back up again. It was just not, I've said it, you know, till people are sick, I'm sure of hearing me say it. Uh, you know, it, it just, it was not a lot of fun that there was no interest to be earned uh, in the world of fixed income. And, and, and equities had to follow that as well with, uh, uh, in many cases. And so last year, Calendar year 2022, stocks returned in general. You, we, the stock market may have done different than that one or this index, but in general, down 18.1%. But look at bonds, down 13%, right? And 
we advisors are always telling you, well, we hold bonds because when stocks are down, bonds are up. And when, uh, and when, when uh, uh, bonds are down, stocks are up. You know, they're, they, they are not correlated to each other. They're counter correlated. And often that's the case, but it's not always the case as I'm going to show you in a couple of slides ahead. It is uh, not always the case. And in 2022, stocks down 18%, bonds down 13%. If you had a 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, right? Uh, then uh, I don't want to do the math right now, but you know you had a portfolio that was clearly down in the uh, mid double digits, right? F call it 15% down. And then we had 6.5% inflation. So cost of living went up 6.5%. Portfolio went down, call it 15%. And uh, that's an over 20% turn in uh, your purchasing power. So from client perspectives all over the world, that was bad. It was a bad year. I get it. It was bad. But look at this next slide. This is equity periodic returns. And what these pretty dots are showing you on the left, this is 1976 to 1979 and so on. So this is 1976 to 2022. This is the S&P 500 index. And so these are chunks of years and the quarters in those years, right? So this is, this is uh, what? One quarter a year. This is, uh, this is four years, each of these, 76 to 79 inclusive. 1976, 1977, 1978, 1979, all quarters during that period. So each row represents four years. Everybody got that? And each dot represents a quarter. And each uh, aqua dot, I think that's what teal, whatever that is, light blue, is a quarter where there was a positive return for the S&P 500. And every yellow, or fuchsia, whatever that is, quarter, uh, was a negative return. So what percent, anybody want to uh, hazard a guess? Can anybody do the math on that? What percent of the time were quarterly returns for the S&P 500 negative? It's 28% of the time. So if you're expecting 100% of the time positive quarterly returns whoop, in the S&P 500, you know, that's just, that's not possible. Now on the right side, what we have are, uh, back to equity, equity annual returns. So on the left side, the dots are quarterly returns. And when we put it all together, annual returns for equities and you can see you can see that uh also we have periods of positive but we have far more annual periods that are positive than are negative all right you can see that and and here we are for 2022 with the down 18 percent that i showed you before there it is but it is not at all unheard of, and we would even say that it is common to have negative annual returns for the stock market, okay? I don't think I'm telling you anything you don't know, but it's kind of neat to see it in graphical form, isn't it? And it's pretty neat to see that, look at this run of four quarters in a row in 2000. This would have been Q2 of two, second quarter of 2000, third quarter of 2000, fourth quarter of 2000, and first quarter of 2001. Look at that, four quarters in a row of negative returns. That was the tech bust, right? Or look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six quarters in a row. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it everybody? And that began in the fourth quarter of 2007. 
And that began a series of six quarters in a row of down quarters that did not reverse themselves until the second quarter of 2009, when the great financial crisis in the stock market, not in the real economy, where recession continued, because very often the stock market is looking ahead. And the stock market could see in March of 2009 that there was an end. And the market turned around. All right. This is bonds. This is the most watched bond index, Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, 1976 to 2022. Therefore, the uh, same time frame. And what do you see, everybody, on your left-hand dots? Yeah. Not every quarter for bonds is positive. Anybody hazard a guess as to what percent of the time these quarterly returns have been negative? I told you that it was 28% for the S&P 500. Do we have anyone now bold enough that I gave you a, sort of a starting point to guess on the bond index? Surely someone can, can, can uh, put their necks on the line here. Uh, we've got closer to 20% and then a guess for 33%. All right, 33% and 20%. And the answers, good guesses. It's uh, 23%. 23% of the time, uh, the collection of these dots show a negative return for bonds. But you also don't see the long runs that you saw. You don't see any fours of negative and fives and sixes. In fact, there's only one three. And when did it occur? Hello? <laughs> Last year. There it is. 2022, quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three. The only time in this entire history from 1976 that we saw three quarters in a row of negative returns for the Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, what used to be called the Barclays Ag, now is the Bloomberg Ag. And it is a it is the S&P 500. It's the most watched index. It's a collection of treasury bonds and uh, uh, mortgage bonds and corporate bonds and some other stuff, right? So it's a diversified bond fund. And last year was the own, that was one of the things that's why last year was the worst year for bonds, you know, like ever. So you see here, the only time we've had over this period dating back to 1976, when disco was going, I was a big Elton John fan. And I frankly, I, I mean, Led Zeppelin was it for me. But, you know, we have to go back to disco uh, to get this chart. And the only time from disco until now was last year when we had three quarters in a row of negative returns in the bond market. Now we look at annual returns and you see that bonds in general on an annual basis have had fewer. You can see that, right? There's one, two, three, four, five years when bonds put up negative returns, right? And look at this. Two years in a row. The only time that bonds put up two years in a row of negative returns have been the last two years, 2021 and 2022. Five occurrences of negative returns during the period versus stocks, one, two, three three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, almost double. So bonds do their job. If you're, if you're afraid of losing money, right? If that's your thing and you just can't accept any stock market risk of all, and you said to me, well, I just don't ever, ever, ever want to lose money, then the best bet clearly is bonds because it on an annual basis. But that doesn't mean that, that on a quarterly basis, you couldn't see a negative return. All right. What about, putting it all together, how about simultaneous negative returns? Both stocks and bonds were negative. And you can see on the left the quarters where that occurred. Both stocks and bonds. One time here and here and here, up oh, two in a row, and then the rest of the time one. And look at this. 
the only time from 1976 to 19, I'm sorry, to 2022, from disco until the present, the only time that we saw negative returns for both the S&P 500 and the ag three times in a row was here quarter 1 quarter 2 and quarter 3 of 2022 last year and what percent of the time have we ever seen both bonds and stocks negative for the quarter well you can see it right here dimensional gives it to us 9% of the time so it doesn't happen a lot. Only one out of 10 times, but it happens. Two thousand. So here's my headline here. 2022 was bad. Why do we say bad? Both stocks and bonds down in the first time ever when three quarters in a row in history since disco have stocks and bonds both been bad. Will it get worse? Right. This is this is this is sort of what the email from our beloved client asked. Uh, uh, is will it get worse? You know, what am I what am I doing to prevent it from getting worse? That's really what lurks behind the uh, the whole thing is will it get worse? So I'm going to try to answer that question with this slide. Will it get worse? By the way, my my uh, senior in high school has just joined me here in Mission Control. Abby Golub, very proud of her. Uh, did her last day at school yesterday and is going to go on to Kenyon College uh, to um, help to help uh, pay off Treasury bonds with honesty and integrity. This is a really, I really like this slide. I, I think if you had to take one slide away from today's session, this is probably it. So what is the data we're looking at? This is the Fama French total, 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 total U.S. market research index returns. You can think about this as the equivalent to like the Russell 3000. Big companies and small companies and growth companies and value companies. The index is put together by uh, Gene Fama and Ken French. Gene Fama won the Nobel Prize, is a, a director at Dimensional. Uh, and, and, and of course, one of the, the, the great academics in the world for financial research. And Ken French joins him up there. Ken French, professor at Dartmouth. Both very, very uh, um, affiliated with Dimensional. And uh, but but you can think about this from 1926. OK, we're not going back to disco now. We're going back to uh, what the Charleston. Isn't that what they were dancing back then? Anybody? Jazz, really. Right. We're going to the jazz age. 1926, way beyond disco. All the way to December 31st of 2021. This is average returns after downturns. Average returns after downturns, where the total return after a 20% decline in stocks, which is what we had last year, about a 20% decline. On average, since the jazz age, one year after a 20% decline in stocks, on average, we have seen a 22% return one year after the 20 percent decline and everybody says oh i can't wait for my 20 percent decline i mean uh 20 percent return this year new capital is going to give it to me look i'm not saying that you know i'm not i'm not telling you that when the clock strikes midnight on new year's eve of this year 2023 we're going to be sitting on a 22.2 percent .2 return you know better than that. You know me better than that. And I don't make those kind of promises because I can't keep that kind of promise. And I don't make promises I can't keep. Speaking of the Treasury. 
but I'm giving you the statistics and this is why we work so closely with dimensional because we want to work with people who are involved with looking at empirical evidence. I don't want to be your advisor based on how I feel. No. Three years, and this is cumulative returns. This is not average annual returns. In other words, what's your total return cumulatively from three years from the 20% decline, a 41.1% return. That has been the average. And raise your hand and send a question if I'm not, if you don't understand or I'm not being clear about what I'm showing you here. Please, I want you to understand. I want every uh, 16 people on the on the presentation today to make sure you understand this slide. Five years after a 20% decline in the stock market, on average since the jazz age, a 71.8% cumulative return has been the experience. So will 2022 get worse? I don't know. I really don't know. I can't tell you, and the, the history won't be written for a while, but if I was a betting man, I would bet more on this slide I'm showing you than worse. But we don't know. Now, should I try to time my investments? This is the Russell 3000 from 1996 to 2021. Growth of a dollar. The total period, if you had remained invested in the Russell 3000 over this period, you had not called me to say sell my portfolio out of stocks, but you had just left the portfolio, you would have had a 9.8% annual return. This is annualized, unlike the prior slide that was a total return. And your $1 had become $10.37 by December of 2021. The best week of performance during this period was the week of November 28th, 2008. Now think back to November 28th of 2008. In September of 2008, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and all hell broke loose. And all through October of that year, Congress was doing, remember, TARP and bailing out banks and bailing out the financial system, and uh, it was not a very pretty period. You know, and then November came, and things were still topsy-turvy, and you could have been forgiven if you had said, I don't want any part of this. Fine. No problem. You could have said, I want to sit this week out on November 28th. And that would have dropped your 9.8% annual return, annual, to 9% annually. And your $1 would have grown to $8.65. And by the way, you could have said to me, I want, I, I, uh, I want to sit November 28th out. And uh, I would have been waiting for you to call me and say, okay, I'm ready to uh, get back on the dance floor. And who knows when you would have said that. Now, maybe, however, you didn't call me that week. Maybe you called me on April the 22nd of 2020. And if we think back to that, this is the best, single best month of the period between January of 1996 and December of 2021. Maybe you called me on April the 22nd, and you would have had very, very good reason to have called me on April 22nd. Why? Because a month earlier, uh, and really beginning two months earlier, what happened? The COVID crisis, the COVID pandemic, uh, went full scale. 
And the stock market in March of 2020, just one month before this, lost uh, 33%. You would have missed the 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 month. And these are, this is the best month ending. Ending. So this is not the start day. This is the end of the best month period. You, if you had called me on... On March 23rd of 2020 and said, I can't take it. You would have missed the best month and your total return annualized would have dropped to 8.8% and your dollar would have grown to $8.28. The best three months actually ended June 20th, just a, just a couple months later. And if you had missed this period because people were still getting COVID, and uh, the vaccine was not out yet, and it was still dicey, your return was 8.3%, a dollar grew to $7.31. And if you had missed the best six months, which again would have been back during the financial crisis, if you called me on September 4th of 2009 and said, I, I, uh, I understand the stock market has stabilized, but the economy is still in recession and we're still got problems in our banks, right, in March of 2009, if you had said that, when the stock market hit bottom, then your return for this entire period dropped to 7.9% and $6.73. So you can see the consequences of trying to time your investments. All academic studies that test whether that's doable by a real live human being all credible studies say it's not doable, can't be done. You have to get the out right and you have to get the back in right. And nobody has shown any ability to do it. They've tested. So 60-40 performance over time. We know last year it was down 15.8%. I told you a 60% stock portfolio, 40% bond, the most common allocation of a diversified portfolio, a so-called balanced portfolio. Some people are more aggressive, some people are more conservative, you know, but this is the one that sort of gets it leans a little bit towards stocks by 10% and underweights bonds by so it's a little bit tilted toward the growth of stocks and a little under tilted toward the capital preservation qualities of bonds. All right. Between 1979 and 2022, between 1979 and 2022. Uh, the 60-40 returned 3.8% a year on average between this period. The five-year average annual return for that portfolio between this period was 6%. A 10-year average annualized return for this portfolio was 8.1%. And if you had held a 60-40 portfolio over the entire period between 1979 and 2022, you had almost a 10% return. Now, what has been the average annual return of the S&P 500 since the 1920s, since the jazz age? And the answer is about 10%. All right. And then I show you here just that, there, there, that there's nothing sacred about the 6040. It got almost 10%. But you may say, and we may decide together that 8020 is better for you, or 4060 or 2080. What, everybody's in a different position. You may not need to take more risk, or you may want to take more risk, or you may be young and you want 100% stocks, but you have been paid to take the additional risk in stocks over this period, 1985 to 2022. All right. Um, I always slow, show this when These slides are from JP Morgan, another one of our great business partners. And this shows you that every year, for the most part, there is a down period in the stock market, right? Even if the market ends up in the positive. So the gray bars, just to refresh your memories, 
The gray bars are calendar year returns. So that's what the index returned for the year. The red dots are the lowest uh, return for the year. The, per the period of the largest uh, decline that occurred during the year from a high point to a low point, the largest decline. And you can see that every year there is a decline in the market, just about. These years where the gray is below the x-axis, in those years, the index actually was negative for the year, right? So this is 2008, down 38%. And this is last year, down 19% last year. This year, here we are, year to date, the market's up about 7%. But we have had a period in the first few months of the year to date where we've had a, an 8% decline occur in the stock market this year. I don't know when it was. Could be going on right now. But at some point, we had an 8% decline, meaning if you would put your money in at a certain peak to this trough, you would have had an 8% decline. So that's where we are this year. Where are returns standing? Well, here's year to date, and you can see that this year has been an absolute reversal of last year. Stock performance this year has been an absolute reversal. Last year was a year, you may remember, to refresh your memory, when tech stocks and growth stocks got hammered. In the first months of this year, look at this. It's, it's all growth. So if you had called me last December and said, I got to get out of this growth stuff. I don't want to hold any more growth stocks. The tech stocks are getting hammered. I don't want to hold any of it. Well, here's what you got yourself. You've missed out on uh, 13, almost 14% returns for large cap growth stocks, all the way down to 4% for small cap. And value has been pretty flat, even blend stocks. So this, this is Coca-Cola right here, 7.1%. That's a blend. It's not value. It's not growth, right? And you can see that small value is the lowest performance. So we've had a complete reversal, and including we've had a reversal in industries. So if you had called me last year and said, not only do I want to sell all my technology stocks, but I also want to go crazy buying energy stocks. Oops. <laughs> because energy stocks have not had a good uh, first part of this year. So again, to my point, you it's just, it's impossible to time. I couldn't have predicted this. I couldn't have predicted this. Now, where are valuations at? Well, that moves us over to the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see that, eh, you know, look, growth stocks, this 127%, 109%, 119% over of, of the average 20-year price-to-earnings ratio for those stocks, is this 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 pump-up that's occurred here in the first quarter, it's gotten the stuff you know up there expensive again. Are we going to sell it? No. It's still a, it's still part of a diversified portfolio, and you can see that value and blend, especially for smaller companies, remains underneath at 90% or so of their 20-year average. So, am I going to say, uh oh? Small cap value had a minus five percent, almost six percent down, five to six percent return. Uh, this uh, first part of the year, we got to sell it all. No, because look, the valuation remains more compelling than it does for this side of the market. Okay, so that's where valuations are. Growth stocks have been pumped up again here in the first quarter. Value stocks look more attractive. But I couldn't tell you what's going to happen for the remainder of the year. I wouldn't venture a guess. Where are asset class valuations standing right now? From things that look least expensive all the way to things that look most expensive. This is developed market stocks that do not include the United States. And by the way, I've uh, told you for years now that international stocks have been poised for a rebound. Not only are they most positively uh, valued of all of these things, including bonds, they actually have put up 10% to 11%, really close to 11% positive returns this year. One of the best performing asset classes have been developed market. And so 
anyone out there who told me, I just want U.S. stocks, don't give me any more international, well, you did it to yourself here in the first part of the year. Because uh, developed market Europe, Japan, Canada, Australia, et cetera, developed market equities have outperformed the U.S. market, which hasn't done badly, but they've beaten it by about 4%. Emerging market stocks have done, however, only 2% positive year to date, but they remained a compelling valuation, right? Here's emerging market uh, equity on a price to book basis. This is on a price to earnings basis. Treasuries yield to worse actually look pretty good. U.S. core bonds, U.S. small caps, all these are below what would consider to be their average and certainly below the diamond, the yellow diamond is where they were at the end of 2021, roughly a year and a half ago. And so valuations remain below where they were a year and a half ago. Municipal bonds got pretty expensive. Look at that. And they're reasonably valued now. And then as you can see, there are only a few categories, U.S. high yield, and uh, U.S. large cap and U.S. large cap growth, right? That's, if I go back again to here, you see this U.S. large cap growth valued at 127% of its 20-year uh, average P.E. There it is. You see that it has crept above this average here. So that's to give you a sense of where valuations are. And this is why we diversify you. This is why I have you holding some of this and some of this and some of this, and some of this, because it's cheaper. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip that one. Treasury yield curve. This is where treasuries were trading in on December 31st of 2021, and we all know the dramatic rise in interest rates that has taken place. You can see that at the end of December 2022, look where rates were versus a year earlier. Bum, 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 look, the whole curve shifted up. Whether it was a three-month bond where it really shifted up to that green color, all the way out to the 30-year, where it went from 1.9% to 4%. The 20-year, from 1.9 to 4.1. The 10-year, 1.5 to 3.9. These are epical changes in interest rates. But also, take a look. Here we are, May 3rd, which is according to my watch yesterday, May 3rd of 2023, interest rates have actually fallen since the end of last year. Across virtually the entire curve, with the exception of right here, and why not right here? Because of the Fed. The Fed continues to raise interest rates, and this is all the Fed has control of. This, this right in here, the Fed funds rate is an ultra short-term interest rate that they give to their member banks. And so this is the only place, this part of the curve, and by the way, we have given you more of this in your portfolio because of these rates. Although I know that there's a threat of default coming from our good friends in Congress. I get it, I understand, but you're also getting paid for that risk. There it is. And JC and I have worked very hard to give everybody some really good, juicy 5% yields on treasury bonds in their portfolio. But this is the only place on the curve now uh, that is higher than it was back in December, just a few months ago. Everywhere else, rates have fallen. Did you know that? Did you know that, right? All the news just oh, higher interest rates, higher, higher. Rates are higher. They're going higher. The Fed has raised interest rates. And we are actually looking at lower rates for the most part for treasuries and generally for other bonds as well. And that's why bonds did really, really well in the first quarter, because as bond yields have fallen, bond prices have gone up. And that actually has taken pressure off of banks, right? Banks that uh, got in trouble like Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic and so on. Uh, other banks could have gone uh, down if the bond portfolios that they held had not firmed up, but they have firmed up. And you can see that because rates have actually fallen. Uh, so there's the yield curve. And JC and I look at the yield curve, I would say, many times a week, for sure. Just a few more slides, and then we'll wrap up. What about recession? 
Well, this is from the National Bureau of Economic Research. It sounds like it's a government agency, but it ain't. It's a private nonprofit research institution that is dedicated to giving non-political, fact-based uh, economic information. And uh, you can see that we're not really in the red here on the most recent readings in March. You know, some of the readings have actually improved. I don't know why there's no reading. I guess the reading on whole, wholesale and retail sales didn't come in. But whether it's real personal income, which is looking uh, good, non-farm payroll employment, which doesn't look bad, household survey employment looks decent, real consumer spending actually improved over the prior reading, um, re real wholesale and retail sales. Again, that's the one where there's no real industrial production actually has improved over the last one. I understand we may see a recession, but according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is not a tool of Congress, it is a nonprofit, private nonprofit, uh, they're not seeing any uh, change in month over month indicating a higher likelihood of recession. We'll see. Consumer price index, how is inflation looking? This is the most recent reading in March. And you can just see from these colors that the inflation picture, which was really, really not too pretty in 2022 with all sorts of outbreaks of 7% inflation in utility gas, 10% inflation in gasoline in June of last year. Um, uh, and, and, and red means that it's up and, and deep red means it's way up. These are the aggregate readings. You can see 8.9% 8, 8 change in June of April. So this was the peak right here of the recent outbreak of inflation. But look how the color for headline inflation has gone from deep red to orange to a light orange to a yellow orange to a light yellow to a green yellow to a green yellow to a darker green yellow to last month what I would say is absolutely positively green. And you can see that reflected in all these other categories. So the inflation picture has certainly moderated. You can see that. The U.S. dollar reached a peak, uh, in uh, a, a recent peak uh, since 1998 uh, or since 2001 in September of last year. You know, the dollar has been very strong. And the word from the travel agents is that Americans – because the dollar versus the euro has been so strong, the word is Americans are swarming Europe, getting all those deals, using their dollars to buy things uh, in euros with the uh, euro and the dollar trading close to parity. But the dollar has begun to fall off from this peak right here. And that actually helps your holding in foreign stocks, right? Because uh, not only do you get the return in foreign stocks, but you also get a favorable conversion of foreign currency that's being earned by those foreign companies being translated back to dollars if the dollar weakens. And so this recent weakening of the dollar has goosed further your returns that we hold for you in international stocks. And let me tell you, most advisors do not hold international stocks in the market-based way that we at New Capital do. They lean toward the U.S., and that's looked very good over the last 10 years. But at some point, that bet runs out, and it has been running out. I have some clients who are concerned about commercial real estate, and uh, there are concerns in commercial real estate. And um, you can see over here U.S. vacancy rates by property type. Orange is apartments, right? And so that's pretty low vacancy rate, 6%. Look at industrial. Very low vacancy rates for industrial going through this year, uh, 2022 and into this year. Look at the vacancy rates for industrial, but there are rumors in Scuttlebutt that that may be turning around and that we're overbuilt in industrial. That may be the case. It may reverse. Looking at the graph, it could well reverse. Whenever you get high prices, and I've told everybody this before, what is the solution to high prices? Anybody? High prices are the solution to high prices. <laughs> high prices cause people to back off from demand or cause supply to enter the market. And so I wouldn't have any doubt if this 2%, under 2% vacancy rate in industrial reverses because either more industrial comes online and that 
that puts capacity on or or demand slacks off and industrial companies looking for industrial space say uh sorry just, just <laughs> not going to pay the pay that rate we're going to delay our plans to expand or whatever <clears throat> retail is in blue and uh for all the problems that retail has experienced uh you can see that vacancy rates of 8% are while they're while they are um above apartments and industrial you know they're they're not screaming up into these upper reaches of this graph for retail space and many people who are in the retail business have been working on repurposing their properties and we'll see what happens there and then the largest vacancy rate no surprise is in offices covid hit right and look at it look what happened here look what happened with these vacancy rates uh, i'm sorry uh uh, right here is the uh, COVID crisis, COVID pandemic. You see the vacancy rate shot up, not just for these others as well. Actually, it went down for industrial, but the vacancy rate in uh, office leaped up from under 10% to around 13%. But let's keep that in perspective, everybody. We've seen higher peaks in office space, right? We saw it in 2002, and we saw a higher peak in 2008. It lasted pretty long here. So it's not unprecedented. And we continue to hold for you a diversified global real estate fund, and I hold it for me too, and we're going to continue to hold it. We think whatever is out there is in the prices, and so we want you to have exposure to real estate because I don't think real estate's going away. I don't think apartments are going away. I don't think offices are going away. I don't think industrial warehouses are going away, and I don't think retail stores are going away. Prices are going to change. Capacity is going to change. So that's the picture there. Okay, that's all I got. Uh, I know I'm uh, over by 20 some odd minutes, 27 minutes, and I'm happy to take questions now. And I appreciate everybody's indulgence uh, this morning and into this afternoon or this afternoon as uh, we've taken uh, some extra time. I threw in some extra slides today, and I appreciate you uh, um, being patient with me. And we'll take some slides now. I'll just take some questions and then I'm going to have my tacos for lunch. <laughs> a little late on the okay. lunch. All right. We'll, we'll knock it out. So there was a first question that was um, the original question from the beginning of the presentation that was just reworded it a little bit. And you may have addressed it, but if you want to just uh, touch on it, it says, um, what are you doing to protect client assets from the potential financial disaster on the horizon? There is potential disaster. Uh Always, every minute there is potential disaster. Um, in on January first of last year, there was a potential disaster of Russia invading Ukraine, and it became an actual disaster and continues to be an actual disaster. Um. On January 1st of last year, there was a, I don't know if you want to call it a potential disaster, but there was a potential that interest rates would rise and perhaps rise quite steeply. So what did we do to protect you from Russia invading Ukraine? The answer is, is that we gave you a diversified portfolio that weighted Russia in a, in a way that um, if Russia if Russian stocks were to become worthless as they did, that it would have very little direct impact on you. And that's what we did. We we didn't give you a big, huge helping of Russia in your portfolio. We gave you a tiny, tiny, tiny smidgen because the markets understood that this isn't exactly the best place to do business or to be a shareholder. So that's how we protected you from that. And we did protect you. There were other people who had a bunch of money in Russia, and they lost everything. We protected you from the rise in interest rates on January, the potential for that last year, by not holding large amounts of longer duration bonds for you. Uh, and um, that meant that when the Federal Reserve began to raise rates, while there were negative effects for sure in our bond portfolios, they weren't nearly as drastic as those experienced by Silicon Valley Bank, 
or managers or funds that held very long-term bonds. On January 1st of last year, and before that, we were concerned about the risk of inflation. And we protected you from that by holding larger amounts of inflation-protected bonds. So when inflation came last year, we were able to help fight it off in the bond portfolio. Right now, there is the potential risk that the U.S. will default. I could go sell all treasury bonds, I guess, right? I mean, that could be, that could be the response. The problem is, is this. This is the treasury yield curve. And in general, as I showed you, the market for treasury bonds has strengthened. This is the data. This is saying that where someone was demanding a 3.9% rate to own a treasury bond on December 31st of 2022, as we have approached closer to the X date, the X date is the date that the Treasury may not be able to cover its payments. We don't know exactly when the X date is, but Secretary Treasury Secretary Yellen recently, I think a few days ago, said it might come in June. There's all sorts of calculations. But as we've gotten closer to the X date, people are have actually become willing to pay a higher price for treasury bonds than they were back in December. And that's not just here at the 10-year, that's across virtually the entire curve, as I indicated, except here where the Fed is having a very direct impact. And so my interpretation is that the market is not predicting a default. And our friends at Dimensional are not predicting a default, and nor are our friends at J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan being the largest bank in the world, which just got larger. And so what are we doing? We are watching very carefully the Treasury yield curve to see if anybody's saying that 3.4% is going to go to 20% or 30%, and no one's going to be willing to own the Treasury. That's not happening with the price of treasuries. The treasury market, as I'm showing you right here in front of you, is not saying that they expect a default, or it would be a technical default. That, that, is, that is a default in name only and not an actual default. Democrats are calling it a manufactured default. That's the political word for it. It's not a real default. It doesn't really represent my daughter's willingness to keep her word and become gainfully employed and become a productive member of society and pay the debts of our country. It doesn't truly represent that. It's a false flag. Fake news. It doesn't truly represent who we are as a country. And I would be prepared to tell you that's pretty much what the markets are saying. It's a default in name only. It doesn't represent who we really are. The people behind me who we're trying to bring up to tell the truth, have integrity, be educated, and do good work, if that makes any sense. But I promise you, I'm continuing to stay engaged in the issue. I read everything I can, and we continue to talk with our partners, and there will be many, many more conversations, webinars, and so on that I sit on and JC sits on where we ask uh, JP Morgan Dimensional, what are you saying? What are you saying? And if we see anything that we think is cause for enormous concern, we will react to it. I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, let me know. I want to make sure that I satisfy the questions. Okay, hey, there's another question. And says oh, 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 I'm sorry. And one more thing. We diversify you, right? You hold municipal bonds. You don't hold, only hold treasury bonds. You hold corporate bonds. You hold international bonds. So there, you don't only hold treasury bonds. We're holding quite a bit of them right now because they really are a good deal but we don't only hold that in your bond portfolio. And by the way, if you do if anybody on this call does not want to hold treasuries, no problem, call me. 
Let me know. Send me an email. Say, I do not want to hold a single treasury bond, and I will absolutely scrub your portfolio clean of treasury bonds, and I will get you other bonds or no bonds. Happy to do it. You do not have to hold treasury bonds. Okay, next. Okay. It says, given it has never happened, is there an order of non-payment of government debt? That is, will holders of then presently maturing bonds be the first to experience default? Will later maturation date bonds remain good per their terms as opposed to market price until they reach maturity i'm not an expert in this area i'm not i'm not an expert in the order of payoff of loan covenants uh but i will we will get you an answer on that and i will have that to everybody within the next few days or whoever asked the question we will have it directly to you uh as to what the order of payments are i think if, if i understand the question correctly it's if you hold a six-month treasury will you go will will they default on the six month but not on the 10-year is that correct am i am i understanding the question that the 10-year would not be defaulted on my assumption is that if if a any interest is not paid on any interest bond then, then by de definition it's in default but I could be wrong. So that's my immediate answer is that if, if, if the minute an interest payment is not made, it's in default. And I'm assuming if they don't pay the six month, they don't pay the 10 month, but that could be a bad assumption. We'll get you an answer on that. It's a good question, but I don't know the answer. Okay, next. Um, there are no other questions that are currently in. Um, so if you get it in quickly, we can... Reply back. If you've got, Look, every yeah, if you've got questions, obviously send them um, an email and um, we'll have a recording of today's presentation on the journal as well. So if any other questions come up after reviewing, we're, we're happy to answer. And I'm happy to hear from anyone. Happy to take all the time that I need to with you. Your concerns are my concerns. And, and, and I've had a few calls lately with people where I've, where I've just, uh, they've asked me a question, and I've just talked about that question. And and I want everyone to sleep at night. I don't want anyone to lose sleep. And I want to make sure that I answer all of your questions and needs to the best of my ability. Uh, we deeply, deeply appreciate and value your business. And, um, and uh, we are committed to making sure that your questions are answered and that, and that uh, we can help you understand whatever situation you are concerned about to the best of our ability. We work very hard to do that. And I appreciate very much everybody on the call today. Thank you for taking your time out uh, to, to, to be with me today. And, and especially thank you to Catherine for who always gets me ready for these things uh, with the utmost professionalism I can tell you that today it was a little, you know, as I was rushing to get ready and she's like, dude, <laughs> clock's ticking. And thank you also to JC, who was critical in preparing a whole bunch of uh, slides today uh, for the presentation and helping behind the background uh, to get those ready. Uh, it's, it's, it's teamwork here. And thank you to Casey for holding down the fort, you know, while we're while we're doing this. Um, I. I you know, I was in I was in Austin for the conference the other day, and other advisors were like, "You you do these webinars regularly?" And I said, "Yeah, we do." And they're like, "Really?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> well, how, how do you how do you do it? And I said, "You know, with a lot of help." But we do them. They don't. So we're we're proud we're proud that we do these, and uh, but we wouldn't do them if you didn't come, for sure. Thank you very much, everybody, and. Uh, uh, have a great, have a great afternoon.